Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today, thanks to 17 Wing Heritage and a good collector friend of mine, Dirk, we are having a look at yet more kits, specifically civil defense first aid kits from the early Cold War. Now, as I mentioned in previous videos, civil defense was a group of organizations set up in several countries in order to prepare for and respond to nuclear attack. And their duties were varied. They would build and maintain fallout shelters. They would operate early warning devices like air raid sirens and communications networks. They would train in the decontamination of irradiated areas. They would coordinate the evacuation of cities. And finally, they would be trained in rescue and first aid techniques for victims trapped in cities that were undergoing nuclear attack. And for this, special first aid kits were issued. And I have two of these kits here, one from very early in the Cold War and one from a little bit later. And this one right here dates from around the late 1940s to the early 1950s and, as you can see, has been converted from a pattern 1937 gas mask bag. Now, this is the updated version of the World War I era small box respirator, which was used throughout the Second World War. Uh, but became obsolete shortly thereafter. So a lot of these bags, and indeed a lot of pattern 1937 equipment, was repurposed. And here's a fun little fact. The pattern 1937 gas mask bag is actually the satchel that Indiana Jones carries in those films. However, since most of those films take place before the British Army adopted this in large numbers, it is something of an anachronism. Now, this kit right here dates from 1959 and is a bit more built to purpose. It's actually designed as a first aid kit from the ground up. This bag wasn't converted from something that existed before. It has the proper civil defense logos on it, and as we'll see later on, is designed to hold much more equipment to tend to more casualties. Now, you're probably wondering, what does one put in a first aid kit for the victims of a nuclear attack? You know, what sort of special equipment would you need to pack? And I won't leave you in suspense. Let's actually dive right in and have a look at what these kits contain. So let's start with the 1940s kit. As I said, this is just a converted pattern 1937 gas mask bag, and it's easily distinguishable as such by this strap, which you were supposed to hang around your neck, and then you could use the gas mask. And then these little vents on the side and on the bottom. And all they've done is painted a red cross on the front and stenciled Nuclear Defense RCAF Winnipeg on the flap. So let's open this up and see what's inside. So here we have the contents of the kit. We have four large first aid dressings, two small first aid dressings, four rolls of gauze, one first aid armband, and one pair of bandage scissors. So there's really nothing specialized or exotic in there. It's a regular first aid kit. There's really nothing to tell you that this is a kit intended for use during a nuclear attack. But then again, this was very early in the Cold War. Everybody was still working off of their experience from conventional bombing raids during the Second World War. Perhaps by the late 1950s, early 1960s, the specific effects of nuclear war would have been well understood enough for them to put specialized equipment in those kits. So let's actually find out. So here we have our 1959 kit, and I'll go into more detail about this in an upcoming video, but one of the ways in which you can approximately date this type of equipment is by the types of buckles, straps, snaps, and other fasteners used. And this particular kit conforms what is known as pattern 1951 equipment. And this was a slightly modified version of pattern 1937 equipment that was adopted by the Canadian Army in the early 1950s. And there were a couple of differences from the earlier pattern. It was dyed OD green rather than khaki. Some of the straps were a little bit narrower and different. And the main load-bearing belt featured the little grommets and rivets that were common to American equipment. So without further ado, let's actually open this up and see how this differs from the older 1940s kit. So here are the contents of this kit. As you can see, this was meant to treat a much larger number of casualties. We have five triangular bandages, which could be used to make slings or to tie on other bandages, to make splints, many uses for these. 
we have no fewer than 15 large shell dressings, Mark III. We have a large box of gauze rolls. We have one pair of stretcher bear scissors with lanyard. Just for the sake of preserving these, I'm not going to remove the wrappings. We have five civil defense armbands. We have a regular pencil and a dermatograph pencil, and this would be used to mark casualties on their skin. So say when you're doing triage, if somebody is too far gone to help, you would mark them as such. If somebody had been given morphine or other drugs to make sure they don't get more, you would also mark that directly on their skin, which is usually the most available surface if their clothes have been burned or torn up. The kit also comes with a handy list of do's and don'ts and other instructions for civil defense work, as well as a complete inventory of the kit. As you can see, some of the items have been added to, some are missing, the kit is not entirely in its original condition. And finally, we have a little tube of eye ointment here, and this is actually based on cocaine. And cocaine was actually the first substance to be used successfully in ophthalmology to dull the sensation in the eye, allowing eye surgery to take place. Otherwise, even if the person was knocked out, their eye would still exhibit reflexes and move around when the surgeon tried to cut into it. In this particular context, this is used to treat flash injuries to the eye if the victim looked into the fireball when the bomb went off. So despite being a much larger and well-equipped kit, this is still just a basic first aid kit with really nothing to indicate that it was meant to be used in a nuclear emergency. About the only specialized piece of equipment in there is that little tube of ointment for flash burns to the eyes. And there's really a good reason for this, is that in a nuclear attack, there's nothing much more than you can do than regular first aid. All the injuries that are specific to nuclear weapons, deep radiation burns, radiation poisoning, flash injuries, are really not treatable very easily in the field. You can treat the burns as you would regular burns. You can provide supportive, or in certain cases, palliative care. But other than that, all you're doing in the wake of a nuclear attack is providing basic first aid for cuts and abrasions and broken bones and all the other things that you would expect in a regular bombing. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Bit of a shorter one this time around. There's really not all that much exotic in these kits, but that's kind of the point. I thought it'd be interesting to point out that when dealing with the effects of a nuclear attack, there's not much more you can do compared to, say, a conventional bombing attack or a natural disaster. You can patch up the injuries that you can, but the very specific effects of a nuclear attack, flash burns, radiation burns, radiation poisoning, you really can't do much in the field about those, and you really can't do much either in a hospital. You just have to provide supportive or palliative care and see what happens. And so it's a bit sobering to see how little we can do in that particular case and why we should hope that a nuclear war never breaks out. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities where we'll look at yet more kits and other devices like these. Until then, I'm Jean Nessier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.